Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now we're going to dedicate this member update to our resident skeptic, GLD and SLV, uh, just because the topic of Bitcoin and the ball earth controversy have come up. So uh, I just want to take a brief aside and talk about that stuff. There's not really a lot going on in gold and silver and uh, just step away from the markets for a while. So let's start off with Bitcoin now. Most of you heard the interview, or if you didn't, you should listen to the interview with Jeff Berwick recently where he's talking about Bitcoin. And there was a Bitcoin thread actually. When you can see here, this is the three-day chart of Bitcoin. If we pull it out, um, let's see if we can pull it out here. There it is. Um, so that's the three-day chart. You can see that if you draw a line from the very top, um, it may be a breakout, but uh, Zero Hedge had covered Bitcoin making new highs uh, for you know the recent, say, four or five months. And one of the commentators came on there and said something to the effect of, uh, well, you know that the NSA invented Bitcoin or you know, that the CIA invented Bitcoin or whatever. And, you know, I thought that was, I think that's a really amusing comment. And my response to that was, well, what would your reaction be if you found out that the CIA invented email? And so that kind of gives you an idea of where I'm coming from. In other words, if it turns out that the CIA invented email, your reaction would be, so what? What does that have to do with email? In other words, email is a way for two people to communicate across the internet sending virtual mail. Um, it's not really complex. Uh, it, of course, operates on TCP IP and routing, and then you have an application layer program that does that. But pretty much now email is universal. There's various forms of email, there's webmail, there's email clients, there's uh, servers for your domain, and there's all different types of variations. But email is here to stay, it's not going away, because it's a very, very efficient way for people to communicate. Now, I like in Bitcoin, or actually not just Bitcoin, but the other cryptocurrencies uh, to that. It doesn't really matter to me who invented it. It works. And so the rest of the time that I spend here talking about Bitcoin, I'm just going to go ahead and bring up a screenshot here of the blockchain. So I've shown you this before. This is the blockchain. And uh, as you saw on that chart, Bitcoin is stabilizing around between two and three hundred dollars. Uh, that's actually higher than where I thought it would stabilize. I thought it would stabilize around 100 and stay there for a long time. The fact that it stabilized around 250, that's a very uh, strong vote of confidence for Bitcoin. There's, a, by the way, here you can see 174 Bitcoin transaction come across the blockchain. So that's uh, 200. That's about $10,000. And uh, I, when I was watching there, uh, I saw. Actually, no, that's about $100,000. I'm sorry. Let's do the math real quick here. I saw a couple of 500 transactions go across the screen. In fact, quite a few. So 500 times 250, we'll just say that's what the price is, just to get a round number. So that's $125,000. So we're seeing a lot of transactions like that. You can see 50s, 60s. So this technology is not dead. This technology has already succeeded. And uh, it's pretty much all over but the shouting. Um, now, as to whether or not the governments are going to get involved with this, well, they may. They may get involved with their own. The question is, why would anybody use them when this one already works and they don't get a cut? Now, as to whether the size of the blockchain is going to become an issue, yes, it could become an issue, but so far it hasn't. The technology, um, Moore's Law, something that's similar that applies to processors, also applies to space. Uh, the space seems to increase more and more. They're also working on solutions, but 
again, uh, if, if Bitcoin succeeds, I would actually be su surprised. It's very rare that the first iteration of an idea is the successful one. Usually when you look at, you, I've talked about before the automobile um, back in the 30s, 20s, I think there were, Stutz Bearcat is a good example of one, but there were hundreds of automobile manufacturers. Most people don't know that. Of course, it sorted out to the big three, the big four, whatever they were, and then it's always changing. But of course, one thing that's never changing is the automobile. There have been automobiles ever since it was invented. Same thing with cryptocurrencies. There will be cryptocurrencies ever since they've been invented. Now, there's currently hundreds of them. There's a 1209 transaction. So that's um, uh, nearly a quarter of a million dollars that someone's sending one transaction in Bitcoin. So you can see it's very liquid, it's very fast, it's very efficient, and it works, and it's still working. So there's hundreds of others that are out there. If Bitcoin fails because of the blockchain or because of other issues, there are going to be others that step right in and take its place. That's why I'm invested in some of the others. I've already mentioned to you that I'm invested in Florin Coin. I believe because um, the issue of torrent tracking and the, the government's trying to shut down file sharing and torrents uh, because of the copyright violations that go on there. And uh, a decentralized cryptocurrency that has a message field that works is going to be able to create a decentralized database, essentially a dis decentralized place where information is stored or at least links to information. There could also be a search engine based on these decentralized cryptocurrencies. So I'm going to have to disagree with GLD and SLV on this one. Uh, Bitcoin is a success and it's not going away. So let's get to another very interesting topic that people love to talk about. Now, I'm not going to call myself a flat earther. I'm going to call myself a ball earth skeptic. I don't really know where we live right now. It's something that I'm investigating. But uh, let's let's look at some of the stuff here. I wanted to do just a, a couple of tests and get some ideas here. The first thing that I did was... I went to this site that does distance between two cities and I decided that what I wanted to do was to take some cities and see how far the distance is to go around the earth on basically around the world trip. What I did was I picked three cities. You can see here I picked for the north, I picked Helsinki to Tokyo, Tokyo to New York, and then New York back to Helsinki just to get a trip around the world to see how far the distance was. Oh, I'm sorry, I put them in the wrong fields here. Uh, how far the distance would be and uh, what it would show as opposed from the north as opposed to the south. So we're going to take a round the world trip here up at the north, and you can see we're pretty much, you know, around the north. And so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go in put these all in. Um, we'll go ahead and put one of the southern ones in so that you can see the comparison. We'll do uh, Cape Town over to Perth because that's going to be kind of a comparable one on the southern hemisphere. And we're going to talk about the hemispheres here in a second. So let's go from Cape Town over to Perth and take a look at that one. I have to go back out. So there's your comparison. Now, the first thing that really jumps out at you on this view here is the size of the Antarctic. Now, let's go to the infamous Mercator projection. This is this is the one that causes all the controversy about the maps. Now, we know that this is absolutely notoriously inaccurate. For one thing, and we're going to do a lot of comparisons here uh, from Google Earth. For one thing, when we just as a to show you uh, how insane, how insanely wrong that Mercator projection is. This is a we're looking at Greenland here. Now I'm not going to go and look them up, but if you do look them up, you can look up Greenland and you can look up Argentina. And uh, this is Argentina right here. 
and Greenland and Argentina are roughly the same landmass. Interestingly, on the Google Ball Earth, uh, they, they really do come very, very close. But then on that notoriously bad Mercator, you can see here, Greenland actually comes in larger than all of South America. Another thing you can see here is that South America is uh, from, from tip to tip would fit with inside uh, North America fairly comfortably. But then when we get here on to the real map, or I will just say close to the real map, we're not really sure, you can see that actually all of uh, America would fit right here in this northern part of South America. Do you see that? So let's look at our trip here. Um, I, th I didn't think the results would be like this. I was trying to pick some places that according to the, the uh, Google Earth that you would be flying over the South Pole. It's kind of hard because uh, everything seems to be concentrated in the North. But uh, if you look here, you can see you've got Chile and then you've got uh, Johannesburg or, or I think I chose Cape Town and uh, then you've got Perth in Western Australia. Those are really going to be the only three that you can pick over here in New Zealand. You could pick New Zealand, but they're the only ones that are really down there in the south. Now, one thing you do notice when you pull up this map, you can see here that uh, this is, we, we always know the South Pole because for some reason there's these radiating lines. I don't know if this is uh, what you see when you're looking at it from space. Of course, we don't know because we don't have any real images from space. We just have NASA cartoons. But let's go back to the north. And let me show you something real interesting. We can also find the North Pole very easily because it also seems to be the strange spot where the satellites, if we believe in them, uh, seem to pick up these radiating lines coming out from the very uh, point of the North Pole. So whatever is in here, you, you can see with these lines here, you're not going to see it. And that's for a good, what, 100 miles across from both directions is pretty obviously blurred out. Actually, it goes even farther, it seems. So we're not really sure. But one thing I wanted to show you here is when we pull out from using this point as the center point, the North Pole, what's interesting is that we see virtually all of the Earth just from this view. Do you see that? We see halfway down Africa, we see partially way, uh, down South America, we see all the way down in the Middle East. Now let's flip it over and look from the south and how much of the Earth do we see when we look from the, that point at the South Pole and put that at the very center. Well you can see on this we only really see just the southern tip of South America, just a little tiny speck of Africa and then we see most of Australia. So let's go back to our trip here. What I was expecting to find, if the flat earthers are correct, I was of course I was expecting to find that this flight uh, distances, these flight distances in the south would be uh, much, much larger than the flight distances in the north. And that didn't turn out to be the case. It, they did turn out to be the case to be larger, but they didn't turn out to be much larger that the flat earth map would predict. So it's inconclusive. Now, if you look here, you add these together, we've got about 5,000 and then about uh, 6,500. So we've got about 11,500, another 4,000. We've got about 15 to 16,000 to go around the world. Because remember, this is going around. Uh, we, we went from New York all the way to Helsinki, all the way to Tokyo, back to New York. That's basically around the world in the northern hemisphere. And we did about 15,000 miles. Now, if we look down here on the south, we got about 8,000, 5,000, 13,000. We do about 18,000 in the south. So definitely not twice as much. Kind of interesting that you can get around the earth there with that. Now, that does at least argue for the ball earth people against the flat earth map. But I wanted to show you something that came up when I was looking at this distance between two cities. First thing, we'll go to the Mercator map. 
projection. And I want you to notice that uh, the first thing I want you to notice is that these, these box sizes here uh, change size. So down here you've got three and then it goes to two and then it goes to one. So this admittedly is a map that has distortion. But even if that even that being the case, we notice that the continent, if we'll call it that, of Antarctica comes up very significantly on this map. It comes up um, not a third, but nearly a quarter of the map. We'll dismiss this and say that it's inaccurate, and we'll go over to our distance between cities map. Now again, according to this map, it appears that Antarctica is huge. You can see that Antarctica reaches uh, nearly as far north or even farther north from the South Pole um, than, let's say, Greenland reaches from the North Pole. So if we look at the Earth from that perspective, we would expect to see um, the South uh, Antarctica reaching up towards the equator from the globe. So let's look and see what we see. We're concentrated here on Antarctica. Um, supposedly it's so large that it reaches up on the Earth quite a ways. Well, let's turn it to the side and take a look at it. There it is. There is the Earth with Africa in the center and Antarctica down there. You can see it. It barely even gets around the edge. Now let's let's look for Greenland. There's Greenland. Does Antarctica go as far as Greenland? Doesn't look like it. How do we account for that? Why is it that Antarctica seems so tiny when we're looking at it on this globe? Now, a lot of people have said, well, you've got to understand that the lines of uh, longitude, uh, when we're looking at a ball and we're starting at the north, then obviously the lines are going to converge to a point at the North Pole, and they're also going to converge to a point at the South Pole. What that means is that those lines get closer and closer as you're towards either point. So that means that the distances aren't as far to go around um, if you go across that pole. Now, why is that important? It's important because when we're talking about the flat earth skeptics, they're talking about these lines radiating out. So. As we go towards the south, the distances are farther and farther apart, and as we go towards the north, the distances are closer and closer together. Those are going to be the two biggest differences between those theories. The baller theory is going to tell you that at both the north and the south, things are very, very close, and then around the equator is the farthest way around. Whereas the flat earth people are going to tell you it's exactly the opposite. At the north, it's very, very close, and at the south, it's very, very far. Now, these flight times don't, um, or flight distances, don't really confirm that, but this view does seem to confirm that. The two things that really give me pause, again, are number one, that when we center on the North Pole, we can basically see all of the continents and all the way past the equator. Yet when we center on the South Pole, we can barely see any of them. Something is wrong with this map. I can't tell you what it is, but it's not right. Now, interestingly, you can also put on your view here, you can put the sun on here. And that's always a fun one to play with. Let's see if we can get the sun in the image here. So you can see it's night here, this part of the Earth. It's day down here in Antarctica and Australia. So let's get to the night side and get our sun. So there's our sun. And as we come in, well, the sun just runs away real quick. Let's try to keep the sun in the picture. That's very hard to do. For some reason, we can't get... What I want to do is I want to get a sunrise. So that, that's something that you can play with. It's interesting. It's fun. 
Uh, I'd like to see some pictures from space. This says that we're 40,000 miles out from the Earth. Funny they didn't put the moon in here. Uh, there's your galaxy, I suppose. I don't know. Um, we pretty much have to take NASA's word for everything, or we can take their cartoon images. So that's some speculation on this baller skepticism. I am not committed at this point. I have a lot of questions as to where we really live, but I know that NASA is not telling us the truth. So back to the blockchain explorer. This is uh, world changing. I'm kind of surprised that more people aren't using it. I did want to show you the um, volume of, actually, I guess I removed that, so let's uh, put that back up here. I want to show you the volume of cryptocurrencies coming out of Asia because that's, that's the big picture here. If we go to WorldCoin Index, you can see that uh, on the 24 hour volume, as far as Bitcoin volume, the Chinese currency now comprises 87% of all Bitcoin volume. That is unbelievable. With the US dollar coming in second at 11% and the Euro coming in at 1%. So you can see the volumes here. OK Coin is trading uh, 62% of that volume or 449,000 Bitcoins in a 24 hour volume. Bitfinex is number one here in the US dollar. It's all the way down at 27,000 Bitcoins volume. So what do the Chinese know? Well, it may be that the Chinese are very interested in uh, getting their money out of the country and Bitcoin is certainly one way to do that. So. It may be that uh, the Chinese are busily uh, transferring, buying their Bitcoins in China and transferring them to wallets outside of China. I don't know. Um, one of the first videos that we did on the Bitcoin channel was Bitcoin and Borders explaining that Bitcoin or any cryptocurrency has the ability to completely defeat capital controls. It also has the ability to have you take your silver and gold with you overseas basically because all you have to do is uh, take your silver and gold and sell it for cryptocurrencies wherever you live and then uh, put them in a brain wallet, fly out of the country with nothing to a new country and uh, pull your bitcoins down and then go buy gold and physical silver there. The only difference being how much gold and silver physically is in those jurisdictions. Now, of course, that's going to have to do with whether there's actual capital controls at the border and that's going to create an interesting situation as well because what it will do is create demand for the precious metals in those jurisdictions where the cryptocurrencies are going so a whole lot of fascinating stuff keeping a close eye on the controversy with the ball earth and also with the cryptocurrencies but uh, thanks to GLD and SLV for those topics and we'll talk to you next time